You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Nikki Gerard and Sean French, who write under the pseudonym Nikki French. I'd like to thank a few sponsors before we get into today's show, because it's those sponsors that allow us to keep bringing you shows day after day. The Son of Earp series by Chuck Buddha, Shifters, Ghosts, and Demons, all set within the backdrop of the Old West. James Johnson, illegitimate son of the legendary Wyatt Earp, dreams of adventure and following in his daddy's footsteps. His mentally disabled friend Carson stands by his side. Together, the friends wage war against evil. The Son of Earp series has it all. Supernatural forces are at work and the body count is rising. Can James and Carson save their cursed friend? Will they defeat the haunted gunslinger before more innocents die? Can James and Carson defeat the possessed before the demon hits the Chisholm Trail? Or will the devil win the West? Curse of the Ancients, Haunted Gunslinger, Summoner of Souls. The Son of Earp series is available in paperback, ebook, and audio formats exclusively from Amazon or free through Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Pick it up from Chuck Buddha today. There's a link in the show notes. Mad Jones, Heretic by Quinn Hillier. Mad Jones, Heretic delivers sharp satire on modern religion, politics, and media all at the same time, along with insightful representations of the vagaries of today's celebrity culture and the lunacy of internet comment threads. Controversies surrounding race and sexual morality enter in as well. Additionally, its setting at the end of the 20th century in the midst of the Y2K computer scare provides the perfect vehicle to dissect millennialist themes as well. Mad Jones, Heretic by Quinn Hillier. Uh, thank you for listening. As always, uh, stay tuned at the end of the show for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Now on to our interview. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have the husband and wife writing duo, Nikki Gerard and Sean French, who write under the pseudonym Nikki French. Uh, they write the most amazing psychological thrillers, and I'm really excited to have them on the show with me today. Welcome to the show, Nikki and Sean. It is lovely to be here. Very nice to be here. I uh, thank you guys for joining me. Um, I begin each uh, each show with the same question, and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, what about you, Nikki? My first memory is of when I was really, really tiny, and I used to write extremely long short stories. Um, so I think I was like four or five. I said I was going to be a writer. I stopped saying I was going to be a writer for a long time after that. But when I was very little, that's absolutely what I was going to be. And, and for me, my, my, my father was a writer and journalist. And there was just always writing going on in the, ha- in the household. And uh, uh, I've just one of my earliest memories is, um, is, just, is just hearing the sound of a typewriter going in the next room. And uh, going in there, and he, of course, this being the old days, he used to write in a haze of cigarette smoke and with a, actually, I'm afraid to say, a gin and tonic next to his typewriter. But, uh, but anyway, that was, <laughs> I, I, I just, for me, that writing was like the family business. So if my dad had been a shoemaker, I'd be here like, you know. Sean writes with, shoes. he just has neither a cigarette nor a gin and tonic. <laughs> I love that, Sean. So the um, uh, the the kind of stereotypical writer, uh, just I, I love that image. I could hear the typewriter and the smell the cigarette smoke, just just uh, hunched over the typewriter, making the words happen. I, I can totally see that. Um, so so you don't uh, subscribe to the uh, uh, the family lore of what it takes to write, huh? No no gin and tonic, no cigarettes. Um, I think <laughs> I think I think if we started drinking gin and tonics in the middle of the day as we wrote, it would be a very sad day for anyone who wants to read. <laughs> right, my, my writing would be very weepy. I, I'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> that would be it. I, if I if I drink, especially if I drink before six o'clock, I just weep and then I go to sleep. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh man. So, um, uh, how long have you uh, have you guys been married? 
Well, we we uh, we met in 1989 and got married. We got met and got it was all like a whirlwind. So we were married. We we moved in and were married in 1990. So quite a long time ago now. Is that right? I think we, I think we met and married in the same year. Yeah, well, yeah. Like we can't remember. He's good at dates, but I don't think he's got it right. But a long time. <laughs> We've actually been married for 27 years. Mm-hmm. 27 years. How about that? Uh, um, were were either of you writing uh, when you when you got together? Absolutely. In fact, that's really the whole. That's the, the that lies behind everything. Because when when Nikki and I met, we were both we, we were both journalists. So in a way, writing was part of our relationship right from right from the start. So we knew each other as writers and readers. But we hadn't we hadn't written any books. Although I think Sean had signed a contract to write a book, which he was very late on delivering. <laughs> Very late, many years late. <laughs> many years. Uh, Nikki, you mentioned earlier when I asked you the first question that, that you stopped saying that you wanted to be a writer for quite uh, a long time. Uh, I, I think that's a, a pretty common uh, story for a lot of writers is that we have this uh, kind of young, blind ambition uh, that we can be anything we want to be and we love books, therefore we're going to be writers. And then the, the world has a way of kind of, um, you know, trying to kind of beat that out of you and, and think that you yeah. must go do something respectable. And uh, so right. That is so, you know, Brooke, Sean and I sometimes go to into schools to do creative writing classes. And it's really, t- when you go to, when you do classes with little kids kind of prepubescent you know but under the age of say 11 they are so they have this kind of blithe and and unswerving self-confidence and they know they can write and then bit by bit they become awkward and gripped by doubts and that so it goes from them and and definitely the same thing happened to me yeah um i i have a friend uh irish writer uh uh, Dave Rudden, who does a lot of uh, school uh, workshops and presentations, and, and he said if you get a uh, a room full of like seven year olds and you say you can write a novel, and they'll say, well, of course I can. I've written ten already. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And that's been our experience as well. I mean, a lot of becoming a writer. I think especially there are different. There's all kinds of writing, but if you're a, becoming a writer of fiction, it, it really is just trying to, um, apart from other skills and other disciplines, you do need to throw off all the kinds of co- constraints that becoming as a, an adult has put on you, all the things of, 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 of guarding what you say and wondering, will it be embarrassing or will people, you know, laugh at me? I mean, you've got to, you know, it's, it's going back to this, to being seven years old, where it's all the kind of play. I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, th- getting to that uh, free imagination, uh, that imaginative state, is, is crucial if you're going to be a novelist. Yeah, it is a strange. This, this I always think it's this very strange mixture. You have to hold together both kind of both great faith, but also doubt, and you have to kind of have faith and doubt together, and some somehow manage to negotiate between the two of those. Yeah, I, I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, so, so both of you were journalists. Uh, did did either of you have aspirations uh, to to write a novel? I, th- I think you said that, that Sean had a contract. Um, what <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> for a, for a novel. He did have a contract. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think. Well, that's, you know, we're both. We're, I mean, when we met, apart, we were journalists, but also we were just you know we're passionate readers of all kinds of all kinds of books and, and, and fiction. And I think we both had in the back, you know, what we really wanted to do was to write fiction, you know, so that was, we were, we, it was, it was something. And, you know, and in fact, I gradually, get, I sort of gradually gave up journalism and start, I wrote a couple of novels on, on my own, but we were always, it was something we both wanted to do. And in fact, you know, one, one of the, I mean, the reason, the reason we, we've collaborated is because we talked about the idea of, you know, could we, could, could two writers write a book together? And, we, and it just so happened then that we came across an idea together for something that we then, that became our first book. Um, I, I have quite a few novelist friends who began as journalists, and I love to ask them, uh, what, what do you think you guys learned uh, from uh, working in journalism that has helped you as a novelist? 
Oh, goodness, so much, so much. So, for instance, the first thing and one of the most important things is that habit of working, is the, is the discipline of writing, I'm not thinking you wait for an inspiration to come to you and then, then the right day to dawn, of knowing you've got to go to your desk and sit there and and be disciplined and be structured. And even if it's a bad day, you have to try it. So that's the first thing. But then... And also just keeping that muscle going. I mean, just knowing right day after day. And that's your, it's both a kind of art and it's a craft and it's a task. And then outside of that, for me, I mean, when I was a journalist, I did, I started off as a literary journalist, but then I became an interviewer and a feature writer. And it's a very useful thing to visit other lives that are nothing like your lives and to get glimpses into the way that people live. I'd say also that in a way, in a much more basic way, one of the things that journalism teaches you is, you know, you're fa- it almost it doesn't matter what kind of journalism you're doing. You face, you, you encounter some group of facts or something happens and you have to think of how do you, how do you turn this into something that you can write in 500 or 1000 words that will communicate something to a reader. So in a way, you just gradually, there's a, there's just, you know, of course, lots of writing is, you know, great novels involve lots of other things, but a lot of it is just a matter of, of communicating what you mean to communicate, you know, and, 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 have, and sort of having a picture of will this, will this make sense to the person reading it? And it's, it's, it's so, it's a, but there's a kind of basic craft, which, so, and people can be very ed- educated in other fields, but they can be shockingly bad at just, you know, it doesn't have to be writing a novel. It can be writing a letter in which they explain a situation in a way that makes sense. You know. I, I would imagine that uh, uh, being a, a journalist or, or, or a reporter uh, specifically would, would also teach you to pay attention to details, but not just details, uh, but to be able to kind of parse out what are the important details, what are the things that stand out uh, that, that are not obvious. And I would think that would be uh, an excellent skill to work on as a journalist. Well, of course, I mean, of course that is true. And every story is your story. You edit everything to make, you know, everyone's got their own way of kind of seeing what's important and finding a narrative thread through it. And then I guess the other thing I'd add to that is just the importance of research. I mean, as novelists, we now do, we do an awful lot of research for our books. Um, and that's something that journalism absolutely teaches you. Of course, where it becomes different is you have to be, you have to stick to, you have to be accurate <laughs> as a journalist. Whereas there's this extraordinary and sometimes scary freedom about being a novelist. You're no longer hugging the shore, you're out there in the open seas and you can go anywhere, which is both a kind of gift and a curse, isn't it? Right, right. Um, so you guys said that you had the idea um, one day that you would write together. Uh, what was that initial uh, kind of catalyst for that idea, and, and how did how did you guys work that out? Well, it was almost a double thing. I mean, for, first because we were both writers, and so if I if I happened to write an article, I would always show it to Nikki before I gave it to someone else, or before I sent it into the, the newspaper or the magazine, and and the same vice versa. And we were the same with reading. If I read a book, I'd sort of want to talk, discuss it with Nikki. So it felt natural to say, well, if we're, we're, we're reading and doing all this, we're so, we're almost collaborating already. So maybe we could actually, you know, actually write a book together. You know. And it was partly we what we wanted to write. You know that feeling you get when you read a novel that you love, and you feel that there's a voice that's addressing you directly. It's this extraordinary kind of intimate experience that you get from the pages of a book. So we would we had this conversation that went on for a bit about whether we could make that voice between us, that seamless, intimate voice between the two of us. And we carried that around in our head as an idea. We thought that one day, you know, one day when our children were a bit bigger, when we had more time, one day we would write this book. But in fact, then we were, we were catapulted into it by coming across the idea for our first thriller, which was called The Memory Game, which was all about the controversy over recovered or false memory. Um, and we read about this controversy and we thought it was such a good idea for a new kind of thriller, a thriller that was both about kind of clues out there in the world, but also clues in kind of slippery memory. Can I show you exactly what it was, maybe? Because it, and what it was is people would go into, it was a real controversy in like the, you know, in the mid-90s, 
where, and where people were going into therapy, just normal therapy. They didn't think it wasn't because of a trauma or anything. And suddenly recovering these memories of appalling abuse that they hadn't realized had occurred. And as a result of this, people, you know, family members, you know, fathers, uncles were being sent to prison. And there was a huge controversy about was this, was all this abuse going on or were people maybe imagining it? We had this double reaction, I think lots of writers have, which is on the one hand, um, uh, you know, what a shocking and serious subject. And on the other, you know, God, what a, this, what a good subject for a thriller. And so, so, and so we partly, we had, because we felt it was a, this unusual new idea, we thought we'd better get ahead and, and get it written. It's like a kind of rocket to us. It made us write something that we might, we might have put it off for ages, this project, but it was, it was like a kind of rocket underneath us, which made us do it. And in fact, we were, we were, you know, we were right to do it immediately because actually just after it was published, we met another writer at a party who was quite cross with us because he'd been half through his memory, his memory thriller, but we got there first. Oh, that's that is such an amazing feeling. When uh, it, it's so weird that, that sometimes there's there's this thing that's just uh, kind of gets into the zeitgeist, and you know other people have a similar idea, uh, but it's always fun to watch how uh, that that similar germ of an idea manifests itself in so many different ways when when a particular novelist takes it to its end in their mind. Uh, so uh, I, I love that. It's one of those weird cultural things, isn't it? We're so the number it, of times two films on the same subject come out. In, you know, it's, people just suddenly discover they're making, you know, a film about a, a meteor hitting the Earth. You know, at the same time, and it, it, it's, 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 it's a, one of those real amazing mysteries. Um, you have a, a recurring character in in your novels, Frida Klein. Uh, was was that her first? Uh, appearance? No, not at all. So we spent the first, we've written 21 books together now, and the first 13, or well, must be 22, the first 13 were all were standalone psychological thrillers, and they had different female first person protagonists. Um, so it's the last eight books, the seventh of which has just been, has just come out in America, which feature free decline. We always thought, we always called ourselves standalone thriller writers. We never really intended to write a series. Um, and then one day we were we were visited by Free Decline, as it were. We we came across the idea for Free Decline as a character and we were so captivated by her. Um, and we thought that she just needed she had to have more than one book. In fact she had to have eight. Wow. Um, I, I... <laughs> I love that you said you were visited by Frida, and I, I really want to uh, dig into that in, in just a moment. Um, but you, of all the books you've written, they're always uh, with a female protagonist in the first person. Yeah. Uh, is, is that a conscious uh, decision, or you know, is that just, or is it just the way it comes? It's very funny you should ask that because, uh, in a way, you know, it, it kind of almost came about by chance because the first we were going back to this very first book we wrote, the Memory Game, which was about. These people, this recovered mem- these recovered memories, and the people that happened to were almost always women, and so it was really natural that the that the narrator of the first book, this first book we were doing, and so when we finished the book, we, we were always clear we wanted to have uh, just one name on on the cover rather than having the two, uh, both our names. So we chose a female author because it's, it felt logical that if you have a female char- main character, you should have a female make, have a female author. And in a weird way, from that moment, we found that we were writing a certain kind of book with female central characters, which then led to writing. If you then discover, if you put, if you have thrillers with the central character being a woman, it, you you get somehow you find yourself in a different psychological territory from from if you're writing a series of books with men at the centre. Yeah, women women are necessarily. Vulnerable. I mean, someone like Frida, for instance, who we now know rather well. I mean, she is so strong and prickly and self-protected. Um, you wouldn't want to mess with Frida, but because she's a woman, she has a kind of vulnerability that a man would not have. And it's very and that kind of meeting of kind of female strength with female vulnerability is a very fruitful. A fruitful place to put a thriller into. Sure, sure. Um, I, uh, I I wrote a, a story for an anthology uh, last year, and when I turned it in, my editor said, uh, "I love that you wrote this uh, 
with a female protagonist and from her point of view. Uh, and, and honestly, until she pointed that out, um, I kind of didn't even think about it. It just, uh, that's who the character was when she showed up and, uh, and, and she just told me the story. Um, I, I think people sometimes put too much thought into it. If you, if you are, uh, if you're doing your job as a writer and you're, uh, you're connecting with your characters and letting them tell you their story, um, it, it shouldn't be a lot of work to force a story to be from one perspective or another, I wouldn't think. I mean, I, I, well, I, where I certainly agree with that, in a sense, what I've, you, you, that you kind of write the stories you have to write. And we find, we, you know, there's certain kinds of, anxi- of anxieties that come very naturally to me and me, you know, about a certain sense of, I mean, we've never, what we've never, we've never written a thriller about, you know, there are, there's a terrorist on the loose and you have five days to save London from being blown up. What we're interested in is, at, but the, I mean, we think most of our books, you know, uh, start with as if they're not thrillers at all. You know, they're about people leaving, leading normal lives and, and about with something, you know, we, we always say that our main characters don't, Realize, don't realize they're in a thriller and don't want to be in a thriller, but just one wrong step or meeting the wrong person or some, some, you know, some bad, some bit of bad luck and life can turn suddenly nasty and scary. And that's, so that's in a way that, so, so for a start, you know, that's the subjects that visit us. But, but also, I, I also agree with you in a, in a, in a sense that, um, that when it certainly is, there is a feeling that when, you're, when the idea is right, when you're excited by something, it just flows. And and the times where there are certain times when where we've we've got, got a quarter of the way through or halfway through a story, or even sometimes all to the end of the story, and if it just feels like you're walking in, in heavy, you know, in sand, every step is heavy. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with the story. It doesn't want to be told. And then so then you've got to be prepared to start again or junk it or whatever. Um, you guys write psychological thrillers, and, and you said that uh, you, you don't write, you know, uh, these uh, terrorist plot uh, thrillers. Um, to me, it seems like the, the psychological thriller um, is, is very much a personal story and uh, is, is about a, a personal struggle uh, and the the jeopardy of a particular person. Uh, that seems like the, the focus is there, whereas maybe some of the, the big political thrillers, uh, you're, you're kind of zoomed out for a, a wide view of maybe a global threat. Uh, is there, are there any um, tools that you use to keep the story focused narrowly and keep the reader uh, really uh, kind of psychologically charged, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, and really invested in the character? So it's true. I mean, I think the psychological thrillers are kind of intimate. They're often domestic. They're about a kind of inner dread, or certainly the books that we write. And it's about having a story that feels like a kind of journey that you go through, but also having the journey of the kind of character. The character should change. And so in a way, when we when we type our books, it's not just about what happens kind of with the plot, although that is extremely important to us. But it's also what happened with that characters. What 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 journey is that character going on? How have they changed by the end? And then it's and then it's what you were saying earlier about detail when you were talking about kind of journalism. It's that absolute focus on detail about what the world feels like if you're standing in that person's person's shoes, what the fridge What's in the fridge? What's under the bed? What's in their mind? How they're seeing the world? So it's that kind of absolute sense that you've got to be concentrating on what's happening inside their mind as well as outside in the world. Yeah, and can I just add to that? Which I think sometimes the, the, Nikki and I like all kinds of thrillers, but I think one thing that you know they can be, you know, they, they, they're not just we don't just read things that are like what we write. But I think one thing that great, really good thrillers, and maybe all really good novels have in common, I really think is a real sense of place. You know, so if you read, you know, some, someone like Philip Marlowe, you know, you, you just, that, you're just in, you can just smell that kind of seedy part of Los Angeles you write about. Or Simonon, Georges Simonon, the great French writer, that he captures a certain kind of really grim, industrial, poor northern France. And in our, in our most of our books, we, we, and we know London 
you know, we, we're sort of soaked in London. And we almost want our people who, who read our books, you can feel, especially, I, and I would say in particular with the Frida Klein books, you could walk around London holding the novel and walk around the streets and, for, and, and it'll take you to strange bits of the city that people don't normally go to. And we want to have, we really want you to, yeah, to be, to be able to just smell, almost taste the street, the streets of London. Mm, I, I, yes, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I guess... It's very good, it's very rare to hear that <laughs> Nikki say that she really absolutely agrees with me, so, so I should actually preserve I'm this like, moment. I guess the other thing I was going to say in response to that question was that one of the things, when we think about our, our novels often don't begin with... The idea of the story it begins almost with a kind of a kind of what if, a, and it, it's like we take it's like we take very kind of ordinary, everyday, identifiable emotion, something like jealousy or grief, um, bereavement, what it's like to be lonely, the things that we all live with in our daily lives, and then we want to kind of ratchet that up into a thriller so it's like the thrillers that are kind of trying to think about what is it like to be alive now in this very strange world that we're in what is it what does it feel like and then the other thing is that and I guess it come, this comes down to writing psychological thrillers is that we're, we're always thinking about and interrogating the notion of what it is to be normal and in a sense what we both think is there is no such thing as as a normal person and that underneath the kind of the orderly surface that we present to the world with this maelstrom of very strange emotions we all are and what we're wanting to write about is what happens if when a terrible thing happens in someone's life that kind of surface is pierced and you can suddenly see underneath it into this kind of strange world beneath um after writing so many uh standalone thrillers before before frida uh, introduced herself to you uh was the planning process for the books different then than it is now uh and and maybe this is a good time to ask you uh about when you start conceptualizing a novel and, and the the new project uh, comes about do you, do you guys sit together and and uh, and toss story ideas back and forth and uh do, do you uh you know talk face to face and and let the story grow uh but because when i i know that when i'm working on a project by myself uh, there's you know a lot of kind of daydreaming about the story and taking notes and things like that but if i have a friend or or my wife to talk to um it seems like the excitement really ratchets up when you start talking back and forth about story ideas and bouncing ideas back that's, and forth. That's, well, that's, I think that really captures what, why it's sort of, um, what the kind of excitement about, about collaborating rather than being on your own. Cause, you know, some, there's this French term called folie à deux, which means kind of, you know, two double madness. And, and it's, it describes when two people get together and commit far worse crimes together than they would have on their own. And there is a way in which you spur each other on. And what's, I mean, the thing is, after this, all this time, a huge bit of, the, of, of our marriage is just constantly talking about, could this maybe, you know, we meet someone, we go somewhere, we think, could this be a story? Could, what about this? You know, what, what you know, we, 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 so we just, it's, it's just part of the way we talk. So, so, so in the preparation, we're, you know, we, yes, we exactly, we sit and we talk about ideas, but also what we really found, and I, I'm, I'm, I wonder if you f feel the same, is so much of your really exciting ideas come not when you're sitting you know, with a pen and a notebook trying to have an idea. It comes when you're not meant to be having an idea at all, when you're doing something completely different and some weird idea just comes. And that's a, you've got to almost be receptive to... Um, and then one thing I would also say, you, you, when we're talking about giving advice, I, I, then I, I should follow it more myself. You really, if you're a writer, carry a notebook around with you because you, you have these exciting ideas and you think, Oh, I'll remember it. You know, I don't. You know, I'll, and then you don't. You you need to you need to jot them down when these weird. You know, at some strange time, some little what if comes into your mind. And they do. They strike you from behind or just just out of the blue, when you don't want them to be. I mean, there was one time when we were writing our third book and we were about halfway through it and we were driving in fact to see my mother who was in hospital and we were talking about how we met and we met and got married very swiftly and we talked about how it was a bit like kind of falling in love is a bit like going mad and how you start you, you trust yourself and abandon yourself to somebody who you don't know um and then we suddenly thought 
we have to write a book about that. We have to, that's got to be a book. And then we thought that's got to be this book, this next book. It's more exciting than the one where we actually threw away the book we were halfway through and um, just wrote that book instead because it just kind of gripped us so much. And it, actually for Sean and I, we've got to have a shared excitement. So it's no good if I have an idea that I love and Sean quite likes. We've both got to love an idea because we've got to live with that for the next year or so. Right. Um, you, you mentioned earlier when we were talking about journalism that uh, that journalism teaches you to uh, to sit down and do the work and to to show up every day and, and do what is required. Uh, but what you what you were just talking about, I think you, a, a writer has to um, to not lose uh, sight of or, or, or lose touch with the fact that sometimes uh, writing and story ideas are kind of ethereal and they just come from wherever. And yes, you have to sit down and do the work and you have to show up each day, uh, but you also have to keep yourself open for, for when those strange ideas just kind of hit you in the side of the head from nowhere. Do you know that, 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 is, so, that is so true? And, but the, and I think almost impossible difficult possibly difficult part of that is you've got to do both so on the one hand you do novels you know a, a novel is about you know between 90 and 100,000 say 100,000 words that's a you know 400 pages that is just you do not do that in a moment of inspiration you, that's that's a job there's a job like going and digging a ditch you got to do it every day you know pretty and but on the, but also absolutely you've got to be open to you've got you you know, while doing it you've got to be open to new ideas you've got to be open to changing it as you, as you, you know, if a better idea comes, if you're, you know, if if it, vol if it involves tearing up two weeks' work and rewriting, you've got to be willing to do that. But you mustn't do it too much. I think there's a danger. I, I sometimes see it in books, and I also often see it in TV, in like TV series, where I feel people have been too open. You, you've got to be open to the good ideas, but some good, I, I, some quote good good ideas you need to reject, you know, because you feel. You know, they they might seem dazzling at that moment, but they won't serve the story as a whole. You know, and so so it's a very difficult balancing act. And that thing you're saying about being alert and kind of you know the windows being open, it, that is so true. So you've got to be slogging away, but also kind of alert and available for kind of madness, really. Uh, does does working together and collaborating uh, help? Uh, that situation where one of you is uh, is saying, "Okay, this is uh, this is what we need to write today," and maybe the other one says, "But what about this brilliant idea?" And uh, you know, <laughs> how do you? Like well, how... Writing process doesn't quite work like that because okay, what we do absolutely together and collaboratively is we work out the the story. In, in, uh, sometimes in a lot of detail and sometimes in less, depending on what the story is. And that can take weeks and months of walking and talking, of sitting and talking, of making notes and of gradually kind of expanding things until, we, until we're absolutely sure that we've got the same book in each other's head. And then we write separately. So we go away and Sean actually writes in a shed in the garden and I write in an attic so it's rather gendered um, and we write set so we write separate we never write together so one of us will write say a chapter and we'll email it to the other who will be free to edit it change it add to it erase it and then they will write say the next chapter so we proceed like that so we're following a plan and we of course well you know when you write plans just you can't stick to plans. Sometimes writing won't stick to plans. It will have to go in a different direction. So we're able to do that. But nevertheless, we have a kind of journey mapped out. Yeah. Um, when you um, uh, when when one person is writing, uh, what is the other person doing? Are, are you <laughs> are, are you giving giving the other one dirty looks, waiting for them to finish? <laughs> Well, it, it is a mixture of things. I mean, there is a kind of just the business of life, you know, somehow needs being out. But also, and also, uh, Nikki and I both do writing. Uh, on, we do we write on our own as well. So we sort of we, we've usually got other things to other kind of pro things to work at and pro uh, projects to get on with. So it's, you know, somehow we we managed to fill the days. I mean, I, I kind of when pe people say that, and I think, well, it would be really nice if half the time. I was being Nikki French, and the other half I was kind of wandering around the countryside looking at sunsets, but it doesn't quite happen like that. 
I think, I'm not sure what we do with the time, but it seems pretty full. Um, let's let's talk about the character uh, of, of Frida for a moment. Uh, you said that you were visited by Frida Klein, and you knew that she had to be a recurring character and had to have a series of her own. Uh, what what is it about Frida that is different from the standalone uh, protagonist that you've had in the past? So when Frida came 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 calling, we had this idea of somebody who was. We always knew that she was going to be a psychotherapist and we always knew that she was going to be somebody who did not believe you could solve the kind of mess and chaos and violence in the outside world, but that all you could do was address the kind of chaos within and confront yourself and be a truth teller to yourself. And she doesn't, she's, she's quite reclusive. She doesn't want to go out into the outside world. And our idea was to drag her out because of something that's happened in the first book. She discovers that she has a kind of gift solving real crimes, um, but but she doesn't want to. So that was the kind of essential kind of drama, the kind of internal drama of the books. And then we started talking about Frida and kind of, and st- we were not thinking then that it was going to be a serial series. We started talking about her and we, we, we thought, well, she's solitary and she's prickly um, and she loves her own kind of little hat and she closes the door against the world and she hates Christmas and um, we we just kind of had more and more things about Frida and she's very good at solving at at, at kind of knowing other people's secrets and she's very good at guarding her own secrets and the more that we talked about her the more that we the more we thought we just couldn't get to the bottom of her in one novel she wouldn't disclose herself in one novel um, also, can, can I add to that, that, that one, that one of the things, that, what advice one could give to writers, you know, there, there's a real danger when you, when, you write, when you write a book that you slightly fall in love with, you, you almost become like a parent to your characters and you want to look after them and make sure they're all right. And in fact, you should do the opposite. What, you, the, what your drama is about giving your characters a really hard, making it difficult for them, giving them a hard time, making them suffer and see how they can cope. And the kind of this... Once we talked about the idea of the kind of drama that Frida was going to go through about going out into the world and finding herself in this world she didn't want to be in, that just, you thought, that's, you know, one's, one plot isn't enough. We want to show her in different ways about having to confront the world, you know, sometimes going back into her own past, you know, sometimes get, being, sometimes, you know, one of the things that's happening now when we're reaching the end of the series is we're looking at the consequences of one, what, what toll does it take on you to have been through all these experiences? And also to have become, you know, if, if you're, if you, you know, she's, she's become sort, sort of famous, she's become a kind of unwilling celebrity. And what does that attention, what are the dangers in that kind of attention? That, we just thought that, we, you know, this was, if ever we were going to do a series, it had to, this was a character to do it with. I think it's really interesting that, uh, that Frida is a, uh, a psychotherapist. Uh, and in your first book, you dealt with uh, kind of this planted memories uh, kind of phenomenon that was happening then. Um, do you ever get feedback uh, from readers or maybe mental health uh, professionals who say, um, you know, I, I appreciate the the uh, the work that you're doing and bringing light to some of these things? Or do you ever get pushback from people who say, <laughs> uh, you know, I really wish you wouldn't talk about things like this. This is, you know, there, there's more to it than just kind of the black and white nature of it. Uh, do, do, do people comment on the, the nature of some of the stories? Well, they cert- we've had lots of comments on the character of Frida, both as a character, but also as a psychotherapist and as someone who addresses some of the kind of gravest problems that we all face in our kind of lives. Um, when we first wrote it, you know, we've, we've read a lot about therapy. We're kind of soaked in that language and we've always kind of been fascinated by it. We have friends who are psychotherapists and I've been to a therapist myself, so we kind of knew... And when when we wrote the first book, we sent the book to a friend of ours, with therapist, just to make sure that we hadn't made terrible mistakes. The first thing we wanted was to be responsible to that world where these grave problems are being addressed and not to kind of deal kind of flippantly with it or kind of coarsely with it. And we think we've done that. What we You mentioned that you said black and white, the black and whiteness. 
big thing about Frida, and we're with Frida on this, is she doesn't really think her job is not to make people happy, and nor is her job to cure people. Her job is always to make people face up to things and to take responsibility for themselves. And I think that for readers, that's why they love Frida in a way, because most, that's what most people are trying to do in their own lives, is to, is to kind of grapple, you know, mm. is to grapple the sense that you don't get rescued by other people in the end. You rescue yourself. Frida doesn't save people. She tries to help people to save themselves, and that's her power. Yeah, I mean that's so. I mean that's so true about what attracted to, to us to the to this subject and why it seems that we felt like a therapist would be an interesting detective, because therapy. There are so many myths about it, you know, and often in, in portray the way it's portrayed in films. But it's just it's not about finding answers. You know, therapists are not magicians, and they're not there to solve all your problems. You know, real therapy is a terribly is a painful, slow process. And I think one of the things about we try to show with Frida as a detective is there's no solving a crime is not a simple thing. You know, uh, you don't have you don't you don't res, you don't restore order by 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 notionally finding out who who committed a certain crime and often and often the pain can be worse after the solution than it was before you know there it's a it's a it's a complicated and messy business so so you know so that's been that's been the fascination for us yeah i was gonna um say that and, and you 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 said it for me that sometimes solving the crime or getting to the bottom of the mystery uh actually opens a whole other can of worms and and uh and not only i'm i'm assuming not only for frida uh but for the other people involved but i can i can sense uh that that frida's character uh gets deeper and deeper the the more uh she works uh you know with the police and in, in, in this manner well, one of the things I used to, I grew up watching kind of lots of TV as a, when I was a child. And you know, I remember, what, you, know, what, you know, do you remember the Columbo things with Peter Falk, the TV series? And one of the things that it suddenly struck me when, as I got older, but there was this kind of down at heel detective who everyone kept mocking. And it, you could understand the first couple of murders he'd solved that, uh, you know, people would be mocking him. But once he'd solved about 300, mur- successfully resolved about 300 crimes, he thought people might be treating him with a bit more, a bit more respect. But also, but also, you never, you never think with these cla- oh, these golden age detectives, you know, like that, or Hercule Poirot or Mrs. Marple, you know, the Agatha Christie characters. There's never any feeling of what does it, what does it do to you to, to experience so much violence, to see so much of the dark side of of, huma- of human nature. And I think one of the one of the things, I mean, Frida anyway, as a therapist, she has a she, she's more sensitive than than any of us to what what the human mind is capable of. And we want to show about what. You know what it does to what it what does it what is it like to be her? What's it like to be a, to be a friend of hers? In you know having having gone through that, so that so that's in a way that's why writing a series has been a, a completely new experience to us. Uh, so, what about the new book? Uh, the new book is called Sunday Silence. Um, what is what does Frida get up to in this book, and uh, and what might we learn about Frida in this book? So in some some designs is the penultimate book in this kind of eight day week that she goes through. <clears throat> and and there is a very clear sense that we want to convey. So although if you read it, you can read it absolutely as a standalone and it should have its own pleasures like that. But it's also part of this series and it's reaching its climax. So we wanted to have a sense of gathering dread. And in this book, what happened with it is Jean was mentioning earlier that she's become kind of quite famous and that has its she says she attracts attention that she doesn't want um and in this book what you have is a sense that that because she's famous because people know about her because there's this character who's unleashed in the first novel who's after her and is coming for her um her friends are now in danger, so it's, she, she feels that she's like a plague carrier almost. She, the danger that she is in has spread to her friend, and it's her friend that she needs to protect. I have one detail, which is also, you know, there's a very it begins with a very you know, a very visceral beginning in the sense that it begins literally with a body, not just the finding of a body, but the body found under the floorboards of her own house. So if you remember what we were saying is the whole whole idea of Frida 
was wanting a kind of safety and refuge from the world. And, in, and by the end of this week, the world has, it's not just that she's gone out into the world, but the violent world has come right into her own sanctuary. So that's part of, of what we think, you know, the sort of what's meant to be the, 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 the horror of this book. As a writer, um, writing a series and having a recurring protagonist, uh, there's a uh, a certain level of comfort in that. You you understand uh, a lot of the framework that you're going to be operating in when you begin a novel, and uh, I, I would think some parts of it are easier because there's no uh, world building, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, that has to be done because you're inheriting a lot of stuff from the previous books, uh, a lot of the set pieces and things like that. Uh, as writers, how does it make you feel to to end a series uh, that's been so popular and and that has been uh, has meant so much to you? Uh, what does it mean to you to to close the, uh, the 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 close out that chapter and to uh, then see what uh, what characters come to you next. Oh, so there's a good question because we're just actually getting used to it at the moment. We've not long finished the final book, and so we've it's, you know Frida is now out of our lives. We've spent nearly a decade living with Frida, and in a way, she's been like the third person in our marriage. We kind of have been going around saying, "What would Frida make of this? What would Frida think of that?" How would Frieda react? So we kind of suddenly were without Frieda to kind of guide the way we're looking at the world. So that's that when we're rather we miss Frieda, you know, we we loved Frieda and we miss her. So there's that. And then what you're saying is so interesting about that thing about the kind of you know the world that you inherit, you don't have to build so much. Of course there's a you know, inheritance is both a gift and a curse, isn't it? Um and I guess that what we are now is we're both bereaved because we're without Frida but also it's this whole new world we're liberated because we're without Frida as well so we can start thinking about a whole new world that we're building and it's exciting um, the new book is called Sunday Silence uh, it's the, the final Frida Klein novel um, I highly encourage everyone to go pick up a copy of this new book it's on sale everywhere right now uh, Nikki and uh, and Sean, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Um, if people are just discovering you for the first time, uh, where can they find you? Uh, do you have a website where people could connect with you and, and kind of dig into uh, to to uh, who you are and what you're all about? Sure, yeah. The best the best thing is if you just Google us, you'll you'll, you'll get to our. There's a uh, you can find us on Facebook, so, uh, so we're we're pretty. Or you can or you can. Um, uh, you can get, you can Skype us, see us on, uh, not Skype, sorry, uh, on uh, Twitter. <laughs> well, it, you know, with a few, few intimate people, but no, on, on, we're on Twitter, and so, so we're, we're kind of easy, easy to find. Wonderful. Um, thank you, uh, Nikki and Sean, for taking time to come on the show today. We really appreciate well, it's it. Pleasure. It's, it's been awesome. terrific. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. The year was 1834. The month was December. I was 14. Irving's tale was by then well known. The characters of Brom Bones and the beauteous Katrina were widely understood in town to refer to my parents. Rumors persisted. I heard the name of Headless Horseman whispered. My father dismissed all these tales, calling them malicious. Yet more than once I saw him and my mother scanning Agatha's face across the supper table, finding only a secret smile and a look of defiance. I found the rumors fascinating. I followed Agatha like a pup, waiting for her to cast some magic spell. And one day she did. The household servants had set a fire in the hearth for her comfort, and she sat close to it, counting out small gold coins upon a lap board. I hid in the shadows, hoping she might drop a coin and I could retrieve it for myself. One of her servants, a West Indian girl, carried a snowy log into the room and set it on the fire. It began to hiss and pop. The snow melted, and the fire sputtered out. Agatha cursed as I had never heard her do before. She stood, spilling all the gold, and slapped the idiot girl across the face. The girl ran, and my grandmother muttered to herself, searching for match and tong to no avail. 
When she was not looking, I crept forward and took for myself one of the gold pieces. Then something remarkable occurred. My grandmother sighed, knelt before the fireplace, reached for the logs, and her right hand caught a fire. Flame blossomed and coiled about her wrist. I gasped and cried out, Shh! Don't be afraid, my Dylan. Your hand! She raised her palm. Flame sat cupped in it, casting the shadow of her fingers upon the ceiling and walls. Lock the door, she said. I obeyed. She pointed to the floor, and I sat, waiting breathlessly. This is the Van Brunt gift. It will be your gift as well, soon, and your children's forever afterwards. Why does it not burn you? I asked. Why should it? Do I deserve to be burned? No. Then I am safe from the fire. Do you deserve to be burned, my Dylan? I shook my head. Show me. I reached for the flame and took it. I pulled back at once, crying out with pain, wagging my fingertips. The fire caught my sleeve. I could not rid myself of it, as if I clutched burning tar. The pain intensified. The blisters broke, and a rivulet of lymph ran down my arm. Your conscience knows, Dylan. You deserved to be burned. Say it. I deserved to be burned, said I. Again! I deserved to be burned. She turned her palm. The gold piece. I nodded and brought the stolen coin from my pocket. She took it and raised it to the light. You cannot wield the flame with guilt in your heart, son. Try, and it will devour you. Do you understand? I nodded. A Van Brunt should not be so weak. I'm sorry I took the gold, Grandmother. I'm sorry I was bad. Don't be ashamed of me. She frowned and laid the gold coin on her lap board. She shook her head sadly. I'm not ashamed that you took the gold. I'm ashamed that you felt the guilt.